Good afternoon and welcome to the University Centre October event. We deliver the events in partnership with the University of Worcester. Uh, they are all free and open to everyone. This afternoon, we're very lucky to have Jo Augustus, who is a, a lecturer at the University of Worcester, and Jo will be presenting her talk on the impact of COVID-19 on mental health. After the presentation, there'll be an opportunity for questions and answers, so please submit any questions that you may have during the talk, and I'm sure Jo will answer those at the end of her um, presentation. Uh, I'll now hand you over to Jo. Thank you, Jo. Thank you very much, Sarah. Much appreciated. So welcome, it's lovely to be here with you today. As Sarah said, uh, my name's Jo Augustus, and this is one of two public lectures I'm delivering this week, and I'm delighted to be here with you today. Um, so as, as Sarah mentioned, I'm, I'm a senior lecturer in the Department for Health and Wellbeing, and I'm in my sixth year now um, at the University of Worcester. I'm also a cognitive behaviour therapist, which is a type of psychotherapy. And I started my career um, in mental health around about 18 years ago now. And I've worked um, throughout that time in primary care and also in an inpatient setting. The, the discussion for today um, is, is a really important one to have with you. And that's really thinking about what are um, some of the key impacts of, of the pandemic or, or what's fondly known as, as COVID-19 on our psychological wellbeing or mental health. So we know that COVID-19 has presented numerous challenges to people's psychological well-being and arguably um, this is one of the, the biggest challenges us as a, as a global community has faced this century. And I guess we can kind of see this um, from a twofold perspective, the actual threat of the virus and also the socio and economic consequences of, of the shutdown. So I promise I'm not going to do a death by PowerPoint today, but I've got a couple of slides just to share with you, if that's OK. And then I'll certainly take some questions and answers at the end and, and I'll do my best to, to approach those with you. So some of the things I'd really like to, to go through with you is, is just to kind of take a little bit of a, a step back and firstly consider, you know, what do we actually mean by mental health or, or psychological well-being? really thinking about some of those, um, those key impacts, if you like, on, on mental health and kind of ways to make sense of that through, through a variety of different lenses and, and, and ultimately human experiences. And then we'll move on to, to thinking about evidence-based approaches to actually managing some of those impacts. Okay. So just, just that first, um, aspect around what is mental health. I think you know it's something that we we really need to kind of pause and and just consider for a moment before we we look at um, the the more specific impacts of, of, of mental health. And one of the ways that we can do that is to consider somebody who we might consider psychologically healthy, um, and and remembering that that's a changeable state of, of being. So somebody who is psychologically healthy might have the right amount of confidence in their ability, but equally they're able to accept and embrace you know, their flaws. In doing so, they might be able to move towards what's important to them in everyday life, you know, whether that's their career or friendships and relationships and so on. They also have a, a kind of good awareness of, of what it is to be psychologically well. And in doing so, they, they embrace that in order you know, to take part in everyday life in, in an, what we might call an autonomous way. And as a consequence, they, they might have a sense of you know, achieving, having purpose you know, in everyday life. And we must recognise that um, there are certainly cultural differences in, in what um, you know, people might view as, as psychologically healthy. So regarding the, the triangle on the on the right hand side, I've just just um, put that in to, to get us to think about, um, you know, how our thoughts, you know, might might play an important part of that. So we know that the way we think influences the way we feel and in turn that impacts on our behaviour. And if we just pause for a moment and perhaps notice, you know, where our thoughts um, are taking us now. You know, where, where are our thoughts turning towards, you know, on a slightly grey, rainy day um, in October? You know, our thoughts um, on 
in some instances, you know, might take us down what we recognise as, as quite a negative spiral. So, for example, you know, focusing on the worst case scenario, perhaps comparing ourselves, you know, to, to our colleagues, best friends, you know, other people in our communities. And as a result of comparing ourselves, you know, we might um, find ourselves despairing in terms of how we see ourselves. And as a result, you know, that might lead to an increase in breathing, an increase in heart rate, kind of what we might see as, as anxiety or panic related symptoms. And subsequently, we might avoid, um, you know, things that we know help us in our day to day life, you know, things we have to do or things that that give us a sense of purpose. So just holding that that triangle in our mind just for a moment as we as we go through this presentation and consider the impact of COVID-19. So just just before we, we move on, um, I think th there's also something about just just taking a broader approach of, of what some of those impacts of COVID-19 might be um, on everyday life. And as I was preparing this this presentation, I was I was really trying to to grasp, you know, what is it um, specifically and, and how can I best um, cover that today with you? And one of the easiest ways, I guess, to approach this is, is to think about our everyday life experiences. So, for example, finding ourselves becoming increasingly anxious and fearful, you know, in everyday life. You know, a place where we might feel uncertainty, um, you know, is um, a focus of our attention, if you like. And, and that can lead to excessive worry about the future in particular. So the way we see ourselves, other people, um, and, and the world in general has certainly been impacted and including, you know, what we do day to day. And a, a, a sort of real um, focus at the moment uh, has been on around or, or specific rather to social isolation, you know, um, kind of becoming um, lonely and isolated from people that, that are really important to us and, and those kind of subsequent disconnections we might feel. And that in turn can lead to feelings perhaps of low mood, of, of anger or frustration. And ultimately, we, we've had to make you know, huge adjustments um, you know, to, to how we are you know, in, in day to day life. So, for example, um, for me and, and many of my colleagues, you know, working at home for long periods of time and perhaps feeling more tired um, from using a computer and, you know, and the level of concentration that that, that requires, you know, the impact of, of screen time, you know, as, as many of us know, is huge. And then thinking more broadly now in terms of those impacts. So there's a lot of research and, and, and there certainly um, you know, is ongoing research around the risk factors you know, associated with the pandemic. So risk factors around unemployment or perhaps you know, the threat of, of unemployment. There's something around housing um, and income related stress. There's also been an increase in intimate partner violence, particularly um, in periods of lockdown. And then not forgetting work related trauma. And we'll, we'll look at that um, in a bit more detail in a moment. And then, of course, there's um, grief and loss, perhaps through bereavement um, or perhaps you know, through loss of a loved one, maybe related to COVID-19. So really, you know, taking a broader view of, of some of those impacts, but also some specific examples, and, and we'll develop that through the presentation. So I mentioned at the start, you know, there's that recognition that um, the, the impact of COVID-19, you know, is, is sort of twofold, you know, the, the threat of the actual virus and that could be you know around um, us contracting the virus and what that means or it could be um, you know our loved ones you know friends friends and family and the wider community and then of course there is the impact of um, social and economic the shutdown measures you know that were put in place to um, you know to slow the spread of the virus and this is likely to create you know mental difficult uh, mental health difficulties um, you know, perhaps from the perspective of, of people developing um, you know, new symptoms that, that perhaps haven't experienced it before. And then also the group of individuals who have had existing mental health difficulties, you know, might find um, their symptoms, you know, um, deteriorating for, for a variety of reasons, including um, social isolation. So I guess if we again 
you know, really think about, um, you know, some of the, the conversations that have been happening in, in the media um, and that concept of, of waves, if you like. Um, you know, we we could recognise that there is a, you know, a, a, like, a strong likelihood of a wave of COVID-19 related mental health difficulties, you know, following you know, some of those issues around isolation, um, you know, housing and financial stress and, and grief and loss, for example. And we could also hypothesise that um, some of these experiences throughout, you know, somebody's lifetime are, are, are what we might expect. You know, we might expect, you know, to lose, um, you know, loved ones across the span of, of, of our lifetime. Um, but I guess it's really important to recognise that, you know, we're, we're talking about a very short period of time. You know, we're talking six, six to eight months, arguably. Um, so, yes, we would expect this to happen, but not, you know, in such a, a high concentration. OK, so my, my students will be delighted to see that I'm um, introducing a model here and, and by a model, I mean just kind of framework to understand, you know, some of those human experiences. Um, perhaps people may have noticed, you know, throughout um, the last six month period. And one of the ways that we can explore that is through um, the Kubler-Ross grief cycle. And that kind of describes internal emotional experiences that you know an individual might have when dealing with change and, and transition. So just looking at that model for a moment, that that journey, if you like, um, goes through through a number of stages, and those stages aren't necessarily linear, kind of typified by you know the curve. You know, we might find ourselves coming in and out of different experiences. You know, it's certainly not a beginning, middle, and end although appreciate we, we all might crave that. So thinking about, um, you know, that, that, that as a model, you know, those, those stages that, you know, that people may go through, you know, perhaps, you know, um, thinking back to February, March, you know, we, we might have been in a state of shock, you know, shock that, you know, these experiences are happening to us. And, and maybe in the same vein, you know, it might be a sense of, oh, you know, that this, isn't, this isn't really happening, that, that, that sense of denial. There could also be, you know, a sense of anger, you know, at what's happening and how it's been managed, you know, including ourselves in, in that um, process. And there's that also sense of, of perhaps feeling quite um, helpless or maybe overwhelmed by, by some of those emotions that we, we might be experiencing and, and low mood, you know, could, could be a result of that. Indeed, you know, kind of moving on the, the, the sort of um, change um, curve or, or grief cycle, um, you know, really thinking about you know, the, the, that sense of people, you know, going through those initial stages, but perhaps emerging, emerging, you know, on a, on a different wave, if you like, and, and actually being able to find meaning in what's happening, you know, perhaps, um, you know, make new connections. Um, you know, I've certainly been aware of, you know, doing things more in my local community than, than I ever have before. And, you know, I therefore have made more connections with people that, that ultimately, you know, are important um, to, to me and my family. And then that latter stage, you know, the acceptance stage, and that's certainly not saying that we have to accept, you know, all the difficulties or the challenges, the, um, the emotional um, states that we find ourselves in, but it, it's something about um, recognising, you know, we're here, um, what are we going to do with this? How are we going to respond rather than react? you know, to, to the difficulties or situation we find ourselves in. And, and that could be about setting, you know, new new goals, new, um, we're using new coping strategies, you know, and so on. So those stages, you know, are, are kind of just a way to, to understand. And it's kind of a model, you know, that, that really resonates with me. And and it although it kind of focuses on the, the, the sort of grief or grieving processes, you know, we can use it to understand you know, the period of major change we're in now. And I, I guess also in doing so, um, we, we are kind of normalising, you know, to an extent what is happening, you know, those those human experiences to to this um, you know, major change. Um, but I appreciate that doesn't make it any easier. You know, it doesn't necessarily lessen the impact, but it just gives us a framework you know, to, to understand what's going on. So I mentioned um, the word trauma 
a, a moment ago and you know thinking about trauma in the sense of you know perhaps somebody experiencing you know a, a you know a horrific or a horrendously traumatic experience perhaps that they may um, have found you know threatening or life-threatening um, in in some ways and I guess um, you know one of those very specific areas trauma or, or sometimes we might see that or, or recognize it as post-traumatic stress disorder um, you know that that can really leave individuals feeling um, you know extremely anxious um, you know and it can be very disruptive to people's day-to-day -day experience over a long period of time Individuals might also experience flashbacks to, to the particular event, perhaps, or series of events they, they had, or, and indeed have nightmares, you know, that, that sort of take them back to, to that experience. And, and that you know, is usually experienced over a number of months. And, and that impact you know, is, is, is huge. And thinking about the pandemic, um, you know, that, that could be you know, about somebody experiencing the traumatic loss you know, of somebody. It could also be um, people that, um, you know, frontline workers, I, I've called them on the slide. So colleagues in emergency services um, who we might consider you know, more psychologically at risk because they are experiencing, you know, multiple traumas on, you know, um, ma many um, different occasions, of, often, you know, in, in a very short time frame. We also know um, that there are a number of war, you know, early warning signs, if you like, around um, the impact of trauma. So if we think about um, in the workplace um, and, and even if you're not in the, in, the, in the workplace, perhaps, you know, people engaging in the community, going to church, for example, or you know, going to a youth centre. You know, it's really important that we notice if somebody um, you know, is, is absent where, where we would be expecting them. So you know, it's, it's important to, to notice that um, you know, the, the impact of, of those experiences can, can be far reaching. And actually, it's something that, you know, us as members of the community, you know, can have an awareness of. And it's something in the last five or so years um, that organisations have, have really moved towards. So, you know, in terms of educating um, their staff and, and also people who perhaps use a particular service around trauma, you know, how to recognise it, what it is. And it's, it's what's called trauma informed care. So really just a way of understanding traumatic um, stress reactions. And, and again, how we can recognise common responses to trauma. And it's really important to, you know, to, to recognise that, you know, not everybody who experiences um, trauma will go on to develop post-traumatic stress disorder or, or PTSD. So just, just staying with um, trauma for a moment, I just wanted to, to really think about, you know, some of our current experiences through the lens of, of trauma or, or adversity. And, and some of these these definitions, you know, might be things that, that you can relate to. So, you know, if somebody is experiencing trauma or perhaps working in an environment, you know, where where they're experiencing, as we said earlier, multiple traumas, you know, there can be a sense of um, what's what's recognised through research as compassion fatigue. You know, so um, perhaps people might experience, you know, kind of numbing, if you like, um, you know, where we might expect, you know, sadness, for example, through um, through death. You know, somebody might, you know, feel really detached and, and not connected where they, they were historically. The individual may also, you know, find themselves re-experiencing other traumatic events. So, for example, hearing a story, you know, um, Maybe you can recognise, you know, watching a film, you know, that's perhaps quite upsetting and then you might have a dream about that film. And, and whilst that might, you know, um, in a very short term way, have an impact on you. What, what we're recognising in terms of the pandemic is, is those, you know, those, um, you know, kind of experiences are more long term. So, you know, experiencing, you know, stories people are hearing about the pandemic, you know, people might be noticing that they're reliving those those kind of events that aren't their own. There's also something about secondary trauma. So um, that kind of a you know acute reaction that um, you know again it's not, not dissimilar to compassion fatigue, you know, they might relive experiences of the people they're working with, I've, I've called clients here. 
So, you know, again, it's being aware of those reactions we all might have. There's also burnout um, and that, that's had various names over the years. So that that reaction to a really demanding job and environment and arguably all jobs, you know, are, are demanding. But particularly um, in, in the pandemic, it's really important to notice that if you're having, you know, that that sort of exhaustion funnel and um, though, you know, over a long period and, and noticing that you're, you know, becoming very, very drained, if you like, from um, parts of parts of your job. And just to just to kind of give an, another um, perspective on this, that that's that term there, post-traumatic growth. So again, research has shown that that many individuals um, may find what we would recognise as personal growth in the aftermath of a, of a traumatic experience. And, you know, that might manifest through having a greater appreciation, you know, of, of you know, of living of life. Um, you know, also recognising new possibilities. And we kind of saw that on the, the grief cycle, the change cycle towards the end in terms of acceptance. So there's there's also an opportunity to, to really, um, you know, recognise what we might call psychological shifts, you know, the way we think and the way we relate to the world. And I don't know about you, but I can certainly reckon, reckon, recognise, you know, huge changes in my life that have happened. Um, you know, through the course of the pandemic, you know, whether that's um, working from home more, whether that's, um, you know, exercising more, cycling more, engaging with my environment in a different way. So th those sort of shifts, you know, are really important to acknowledge. And, and actually, you know, that sense of, um, you know, strength from adversity, I think is really important to acknowledge. But equally, it's important that not everybody, you know, will experience um, the, the pandemic in, in, in this way. You know, it certainly presents an awful lot of challenges or, or significant challenges to mental health, you know, in, in particular, um, influencing how people, you know, understand the world and, and their own place in it. OK, so just just moving away from some of the impacts now to, to sort of thinking about some of the approaches that we can take, you know, to, to manage those impacts. And I've got a got a, another um, model to show you in a moment, but that that sort of two pronged approach um, that that's been applied throughout, um, you know, COVID nineteen kind of gives us a, a you know a model for understanding the mental health impacts as well, and that will become clear when I show you the model. So that that two pronged approach could be around prevention and strengthening. So in other words, you know, really taking. Um, strategies to to kind of prevent individuals mental health deteriorating and then also supporting individuals um, you know to cope so you know providing different coping strategies if you like or, or ways to learn those and of course we can't forget that we've got you know an excellent number of community services available for people and also resources if they wanted to to access those and I've, I've got that um, or for the details about those um, on the very last slide. So we could also consider um, the workplace um, mental health programmes. So I guess, it, you know, it, it's just being aware that there, there is support available and it's, it's kind of in ways that maybe we haven't needed to ask before and therefore aren't always aware. OK, so I mentioned the, the model a moment ago. And this is um, something that was actually tweeted not not too long ago, um, nearer the start of the pandemic. So thinking about interventions to, to really support people's own resilience in terms of mental health and, and also accessing service provision. So, you know, if we think about the, the first curve um, and how that might link to, you know, the, the curve that we saw quite early on in the pandemic in terms of um, the number of instances, let's say. Um, or, or diagnoses, hospital admissions and, and sadly deaths as a result of, of COVID. We knew that there are a number of public health measures, you know, put in place. Um, but equally, um, you know, there are also a number of lifestyle you know, changes that were suggested, you know, whether that was physical health, um, you know, so thinking about exercise, thinking about diet and, and so on. So those interventions, you know, in place, you know, to, to sort of you know, support, if you like, and, and, you know, prevent further deterioration. And if we think also now um, that there's there's that sort of second curve, 
you know, really thinking about now is the time to, to really focus on, you know, our psychological well-being and, and any implications of that, particularly, you know, as we move out of, out of summer into autumn and winter um, and, you know, really thinking about the impact of, of that as well. So just kind of using that as a as a sort of blueprint, you know, if you like to to kind of understand um, and to think about how we can, you know, support and improve mental health difficulties. So I hope that's that's kind of a helpful you know, sort of reference, if you like. OK, so moving again to, to sort of those those evidence based interventions, and I really just wanted to highlight um, thinking and, and the importance that thinking has you know on our on our well-being so just drawing on the earlier triangle that i that i showed you you know i mentioned that the way we think you know, certainly has a big impact on the way we feel and, and in turn our behavior and one of the things that you know we can we can do is to notice you know notice where our thoughts are right now and i wonder you know if, if we were all to do that right now you know, we might be, be quite shocked at how much of our thoughts are on a kind of loop, you know, if you like, you know, noticing perhaps how judgmental they are or noticing, you know, the impact of those judgments, you know, on our perhaps physical self or maybe you know, the way we feel about ourselves, other people and the world in general. And also maybe noticing how draining, you know, that loop can be, the loop of, of thinking. And if we stop and actually notice, you know, our thoughts, notice that that kind of thought spiral. Then we can make a choice. And I guess one of the choices I've got on the slide here um, and, and just a couple of, of examples of, of types of um, thinking patterns we might have. And I'll, I'll let you into a, a secret. Some of these are ones that I can certainly, certainly uh, recognise in myself. So perhaps thinking about um, that critical self, the second one down, you know, if we were to notice how much we are um, critical of ourselves for, for whatever reason, you know, maybe we are saying that we need to work harder, faster, we need to do more, you know, why haven't we done more? And if we can recognise that that sort of thought pattern, notice its impact and, and kind of in doing that, we're noticing that, that internal bully, if you like, the bully that, that is being really critical. And then we've got that choice. But if we don't notice, then we can't choose. And I'll come on to what I mean by by the choice in a moment. So I guess I guess the ways of thinking and that that triangle I showed you earlier, you know, are really important in terms of, of that psychological well-being. And perhaps you can can recognise yourselves, you know, any of those, perhaps the critical self or maybe um, maybe that compare and despair, you know, in terms of, you know, noticing what our friends are doing versus what we're doing. Or maybe that catastrophizing thought process, you know, always focusing on the, on the worst case scenario. And that, that's really difficult at the moment because, you know, often, you know, media, social media, you know, can have a have a big impact on on, you know, how we might see ourselves in the world at the moment. OK, so forgive the busy slide. Um, Sarah will know that I, I've, um, I've cut a few words down, but I do apologise. I would say the same to my students. So on a, on a note with, with thinking, there's something about worry and uncertainty. You know, there, there's an awful lot of uncertainty at the moment in terms of, you know, what we're being told to do or not to do. And equally, there's also that sense of isolation and, and loneliness that can follow in, in lots of areas of our lives. You'll notice that, um, that Sarah's in, in the office and you'll notice that I'm I'm sat in in my my study at home, so you know I can I can feel that I'm quite jealous at the moment of Sarah being being in the office, being with colleagues, you know, having those interactions. Um, you know, as as I'm um, certainly really enjoying being here with you today, but Sarah, my experience is very different. You know, on our on our busy working day, so you know, it's really important for me to notice perhaps those connections I would normally have with colleagues in the corridor in the office. That are really important to me and how I can adapt you know, to manage those and ultimately minimising the impact. So those four points there, so there's something about noticing and acknowledging worry um, and worry can be um, noticed by those what if thoughts, you know, what if that worst case scenario happens, you know, what if, um, 
you know, I go into work and, you know, I, I don't see, you know, my, my really good, good friends and, and good colleagues. What does that mean in terms of me and my, my well-being? And if, if we can notice, you know, those patterns of, of worry in terms of the way we think, you know, but like I said earlier, you know, we can make a choice to do something different. We've also got an opportunity to reframe the worry. And, and by that, I mean, you know, not dismissing it, not ignoring it or, or pushing it away and kind of getting into a dance with, you know, with our unhelpful thinking patterns. But there's something about, you know, seeing if we can acknowledge, you know, that worry is part of here and now, but it doesn't define us. You know, there's lots of other things that are, you know, um, part of us and, and what we do. There's also the strategy around worry postponement. So there's something about, you know, noticing throughout our busy days that we might drift towards worry and encouraging people to acknowledge it. You know, you might find writing it down helpful and then actually postponing it. So the, the fourth point, you know, scheduling worry time in your day. So perhaps that could be, you know, at the end of your busy day, having having finished work and maybe setting a time frame. So no more than 30 minutes and being really strict with yourself there. And at the end of the busy day in your 30 minutes of worry time, inviting you to, to establish if each worry is what we might recognise as a real problem. So something we can actually do something about right now. Or is it something that's that's more hypothetical? You know, in other, word, we're, in other words, um, you know, something that we can't really do anything about right now because it's future facing, you know, the, those unknowns, if you like, in, in, in the current climate. So, you know, if it is a, you know, a real problem, you know, get on with that, you know, finding those solutions and, and do something about it, you know, plan it if you need to. If it's a hypothetical worry, then there's something about acknowledging that you cannot do anything about it right now. So there's something about planning to, to let the worry go as a result. And often, often people ask, you know, how, how do I do I let worry go? And, and that's you know, not an easy task. You know, I really, really appreciate that. So I've just got a couple of suggestions here for you. That there is something about making a choice, um, a choice to to focus your attention on, you know, things that we can control. So, you know, perhaps slowing things right down, you know, in, in some instances. So slowing things down moment to moment and making a choice, you know, where you, you want to focus your attention right now. So my focus of attention, you know, is um, doing this presentation here. Um, and also engaging, you know, with that in, in different ways in the online environment we find ourselves in. Another way to, to kind of really engage in the here and now is to, to think about our senses. So, you know, applying our senses in, in perhaps a different way than, than you're used to doing. So, for example, one of one of the senses that I really like to to kind of ground myself um, in, in the here and now with is sound. So really being curious about what I can hear here in this this environment that, that, that I'm in at the moment. So, you know, hearing the sound of my voice, hearing um, some bird song outside of the window here. So noticing the different layers of sound, if you like. And really kind of noticing the distance between me and the sounds, you know, and so on. So, you know, it's really kind of tuning into to senses. And really kind of focusing our attention. So if we imagine our attention is like the, the beam of a torchlight, so we're kind of narrowing the beam of that torchlight to that moment by moment awareness, grounding us, if you like, so slowing things down. And again, that gives us an opportunity to do things to take care of ourselves you know, if, if we need to. And that can be, you know, through a number of different means. That can be through, you know, talking to, to good friends about the weather. It could be, you know, planning a socially distanced events with a friend, going for a walk with a friend and so on. There's also something about compassion. You know, I mentioned earlier about that, that inner bully that, that can occur. So really noticing, you know, if that bully occurs and, you know, trying to, to be a bit kinder to ourselves in, in that moment. And, you know, often noticing if we're kind of shouting at ourselves, 
metaphorically speaking, you know, if we can just kind of turn down the volume of that, and, you know, and, and there's something about acknowledging that this is a difficult time at the moment. And those those questions, you know, could be could be helpful as well, you know, trying to see things from another perspective, you know, that that critical voice you might be noticing, you know, would you talk to your best mate like that or would your best mate talk to you? You know, so giving us a bit of wiggle room to, to kind of refrain, you know, what's what's actually happening for us. So. If we think about the different um, types of, of thinking, you know, we experience them, um, you know, we have thoughts every second of every day, you know, and often our thoughts are, are kind of hijacked in a, in a perhaps in a moment in time by, you know, really intense experience. So really noticing that, you know, the focus of our attention might be, you know, on our thoughts at that moment, you know, that, that, that inner bully, that critical self will maybe um, worry about the future and, and so on. And really taking that opportunity to, to be curious, you know, curious about engaging our senses, the sound example I gave you a moment ago. And that gives us an opportunity to notice our thoughts, but also engage, you know, in that moment by moment awareness as well. And you may have come across um, the concepts around mindfulness and whilst mindfulness, um, you know, it certainly isn't, isn't right for everybody. There's a lot of evidence to say that, you know, practicing um, mindfulness based strategies, you know, can be helpful to, to kind of notice how our attention, you know, affects our well-being and then coming back to that present moment experience. And if we kind of see, you know, the way we we think um, as, a, as a kind of theatre, theatre of our minds and, you know, to really notice how how the theatre of our minds might be hijacked sometimes by really unhelpful thought processes or, or dramas that might unfold in our mind's eye and, you know, really shifting, you know, our focus of our attention to our sensory experience can be can be a really helpful way to manage that. So I've just got a couple more slides before we um, we we think about um, some questions from you, and and this slide is is based on um, the five ways to well-being, and and that's um, something that you may have come across in in different ways. Um, so I guess if we if we think about some of those aspects and how how they might be helpful for you, and indeed you might be doing them already. So making sure that we've got a routine. Um, you know, giving ourselves, you know, that structure. And I don't mean, you know, certainly a rigid diary, but just thinking about how we can spend our time in a meaningful way. There's something about, you know, remembering, you know, acts of kindness that, that we've done and, you know, our involvement in those, you know, whether that's our local community, our workplace and, and so on. And equally acknowledging those, those achievements, however big or small, not forgetting, you know, um, you know, what, what we do and, and the impact that that can have. There's also something about um, noticing what triggers worry. And once you notice those, seeing if, if it's helpful to limit. So, for example, you know, social media um, usage, you know, you're finding is making you quite anxious or maybe you're finding it quite draining. You know, there's an opportunity just to try, just to try and reduce or, or limit, um, you know, the time that you're exposed to those worries each day and, and see. And that that last one is, you know, is really important to, to, to consider. Um, there is something about physical distancing at the moment, but it's certainly not about social isolation. So, you know, really inviting you to think about creative ways to to speak to friends and family and, and people that are really important to you and making sure that you set time aside, you know, as I said earlier, um, to do that. And I found, found this um, quote from Brené Brown. Um, you know, there's something about noticing it's really awkward at the moment, you know, not, not being able to perhaps hug or get close to people that, you know, are important to us. But there's something about noticing, you know, we're, we're being really brave and not forgetting to be kind to ourselves and remembering you're not on your own. OK, so I mentioned about further reading. Um, often people will ask about um, what resources are available um, specific to mental health. And these are just some examples. You'll notice the, the Overcoming series there uh, is one 
that's been recommended by counsellors, psychologists, and th these are certainly you know all books that I I've read and, and can certainly recommend if if you want to do some more reading. Um, and there's also two texts there um, focus on children and young people. So that, again, that might be something that's that's relevant to you. And equally, in terms of mindfulness, um, the the book there. Um, finding peace in a frantic world. If if you've never experienced or, or done any reading or, or research around mindfulness and you're interested, that that could be a good starting point for you. Um, and it's also got some audio tracks available. Um, and and just to remind you, in terms of some of those services available, so um, Worcestershire Healthy Minds um, or a, um, a connected service in in Herefordshire, um, which you can access through self referral if if you feel that's appropriate. OK, so I'm going to stop talking now. Um, I promised I wasn't going to do death by PowerPoint. <laughs> so, Sarah, I wonder if we've, we've got any questions, which I'd be delighted to go through. Thank you, Joe. We do. Um, we do have some questions, so I'll, I'll um, read those out one by one. Um, so uh, the first one is coming through. Bear with me a second. Let me just wait for that to come through. Yeah, of course. Take your time. OK. Right, so the first one has come through um, and has asked what would be the single most effective solution to stem the mental health pandemic? Oh, that, that's that's a really good question. So really, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that one. And I, 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 I guess, um, you know, it's really important to, to raise and I'm not sure there's one single thing, you know, that, that we can do. Um, but you know, certainly some of the things that I've outlined today, you know, we could consider, you know, in terms of, you know, really thinking about preventing people with mental health difficulties, symptoms deteriorating and also, you know, providing um, other coping strategies, you know, to to strengthen people that you know, may may be experiencing, you know, worsening of their symptoms. And that's that's a really individual experience. You know, that could be. Um, you know, somebody might want to read a book, you know, some of the books that are on the, the screen at the moment, or, you know, it might be that somebody recognises this has happened in their life before and, and it's something that will pass, you know, without much intervention. Other people, you know, might want to, um, you know, seek more, su more support perhaps from their GP or from their friends and family and their wider community. So I think, you know, there's not necessarily a one size fits all, um, but it's really important that we have these discussions, you know, they're, they're still a stigma around talking about mental health and, and our psychological well-being um you know the more important you know the the, the sort of focus we we give to those, those kind of discussions you know is is never been more important in, in the current climate no, thank you joe thank you um i've got another another one um for you at what point would you sorry what at what point would normal worrying become a potential mental health issue oh it's another good question <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's that's actually something that you know I I would quite often get asked, um, you know, in terms of my um, my role as a cognitive behaviour therapist, and mm -hmm. and I guess that's the same with any mental health difficulty. So if we think about the impact that um, you know a particular symptom is having, you know, is is it quite minor? Um, you know, does does it in, interfere with your day? Um, or, or is it more significant? And I guess when when something has a significant impact, you know, that that might be the time to think, yeah, may, maybe this is having a big impact, you know, over a, a period of time. And it might be helpful for me to explore, you know, something to, to help myself. And again, you know, that that is, you know, very personal experience. And what I wouldn't want people to feel today through through our conversations is that, you know, they they have to seek support because of, you know, maybe some of the things ring true for them you know it's more about you know just just highlighting having that awareness and and recognizing you know if um you know somebody has stopped you know doing what they normally do you know for the last six months if somebody has perhaps become very isolated you know and it's start, starting to express um you know thoughts of not enjoying anything anymore um and perhaps that's that's led to them losing their job or perhaps that's led to them losing friendships, um, relationships and so on, then that that might be the time. So I guess if we kind of see it on a continuum um, and again, you know, that's not saying that people have to have to seek support, but it's just knowing that it's there if they if they choose to. 
Thank you very much, Joe. Um, uh, uh, how long do you think we continue to see the effects of COVID-19 on mental health? Mm. Oh, thanks for that that question. And that that's certainly something I've, you know, I've given a lot of thought to recently. And I'm wondering, that image I showed you earlier um, of, of the sort of following the same um, curve, if you like, of the pandemic, you know, I'm wondering if, you know, we, we will be noticing the impact on mental health you know over over many months perhaps even years to years to come um but equally you know rather than just just seeing that as a one-track road you know i mentioned about you know the growth that, that can occur as a result you know um that there is one thing you know that i you know i um you know i really hold dear you know in terms of my my role as a, as a cognitive behaviour therapist and that is hope you know there, there is always hope for change and hope for difference and everybody's journey getting there you know is different and it's not going to be an easy one um, and in a way it might be helpful to, to rather than seeing it having a beginning middle and end is to see how we can exist alongside it you know what it, what adaptations can we make you know like we you know I said earlier about working from home and and making sure that I, I had a coffee earlier with a good colleague friend of mine and making sure you know that I have have those interactions on a regular basis are you know really important um for me and and arguably I've adapted as a result you know she's adapted as well to having having a coffee over uh, over Microsoft Teams but making sure you know that we have you know other things in our day and other connections um so you know those adaptations you know things that we've done now you know is there a way that we can embed those you know in everyday life experiences and therefore not be so preoccupied perhaps with you know when is this going to end because mm -hmm. that could you know lead us to feeling the opposite of hope you know hopelessness and that's what would really discourage um so really really thinking about what else can we i um, you know, do to to kind of move forward with this, particularly as the the seasons are changing. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, has there been, or do you think there will be a cultural shift as a result of the pandemic? Mm, absolutely, good good point to make there. And I, um, I think that there's something about you know how how we've evolved in in society, and we could kind of see um, you know people. You know commuting if you like um to work and, and if we were to look at that over the last 30 years you know people commuting to work you know has 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 gone up exponentially and you know i can relate to that um i i live north bristol um and i i, I work in in worcester um so i think if we think about how how you know we've changed over time and perhaps that's that's kind of contracted if you like in in the pandemic you know we working at home more often you know We've, we've become perhaps a bit more focused on our communities um, and where I live, you know, and I said earlier about, you know, um, meeting more people in, in the community. So, you know, through my husband and I doing doing a lot more walks locally, you know, we've seen the same people <laughs> at the similar time. So, you know, we've had conversations and we've got those networks that we didn't have before. And there's also, you know, something about people reflecting, you know, on what's important to them, you know, and there's something about, you know, threat, if you like, and, you know, perhaps if we do feel threatened over a period of time, that helps us evaluate, yeah, what, what is important. You know, if, if I were, you know, to contract COVID-19 and, and die, you know, what's important to me today? You know, what am I going to do right now um, in the knowledge that I might, you know, my, my, my life might end prematurely, for, you know, for example, and I appreciate that's an extreme example, but, you know, there is something about, um, you know, people really tuning into where is it they want to be? You know, where have they been? Doesn't dictate, you know, so just because we've been on a particular journey doesn't mean we have to keep on that journey. You know, we might go left or right or up or down. You know, you know, I think it's it's certainly a way to embrace um, you know, our values, what's important, and you know, that that can define where we move forward. Thank you very much. Uh, could the impact on mental health ultimately lead to more health concerns than the actual physical pandemic? Mm. It, I, absolutely. Um, we we know, you know, from from research that um, you know mental health does affect our physical well-being. You know, it's very difficult to separate out mind and body. You know, if if people are experiencing prolonged periods of stress, then they might find, you know, they're initially they're a bit more achy. Um, 
you know, they might find pain emerges or, you know, other things happen. So it's, you know, it's really important to, to notice, you know, again, when, when that happens and to really start pulling back, hitting the pause button, metaphorically speaking, and noticing, you know, if, if we're f- you know, thinking a certain way, is that affecting, you know, our emotional well-being? Is that affecting our physical health? And therefore, can we make some changes? So absolutely. And, and, you know, we're hearing that in the news of in the last few weeks around, um, you know, long COVID, you know, in terms of anybody who has, in, has, has contracted COVID and recovered, you know, is experiencing other physical health problems that they didn't have before. So, you know, again, it's being really aware of what those are and how we can manage those, you know, in terms of making sure people are living the lives you know, that they want to be living. Okay, thank you very much. Um, is it likely young children are going to be fundamentally changed if they grow up in the next couple of years with everyone wearing masks in public and confusion maybe if we go back to normal? Mm. Oh, these are some great questions. Um, I, I, and I, I guess, you know, yes, we, we can certainly see that in adults as well. You know, I don't know about, about you, Sarah, but I can relate to really missing people smiling. You know, I'm, I'm known as a bit of a smiler in, in the corridor and you know wearing a mask you know really takes that away you know I can't make I can make eye contact but I can't see if somebody's smiling or not and you can probably just about see my creases above the mask maybe um you know if if I'm smiling but it's really difficult to have those connections so you know I can feel a bit um perhaps deflated you know uh, as a result because I might rely on that as a form of communication with somebody from a distance or even even close up and I think if we think about that across the life course absolutely and, and it's really important that we monitor children, and young people's well-being, um, you know, as a result of that and put things in place. You know, so, you know, if children are excessively worrying, if children are, um, you know, feeling quite isolated as a result of mask wearing and disconnected, you know, what, how, how can we mitigate that? How can we manage it? And also research plays, you know, a really important role in all of this. You know, we need to, to be conducting you know, research around how, you know, this is kind of over a period of time, what we might call a longitudinal study. And I know that those studies have certainly started um, across you know, different areas of life and, and across the life course. Mm. Thank you. Uh, we're almost there, Jo. Thank you very much. Uh, where is the best right. place to start to connect with good support for mental health when feeling very isolated? Oh, that, that's, that's such an important question. Um, and I, I, I guess it, it's, it's a really personal um, you know, decision to make, but, you know, it might be, you know, your GP, you know, GP perhaps being the centre of, of care from, from birth to death and thinking about making contacts with your GP surgery because they m- might be able to, to signpost you quite quickly to local services. Um, you know, pre-pandemic, I'm, I may suggest that people look at library notice boards for things, you know, to engage with, you know, in their local community. Um, but again, you know, depending on um, people's availability and, and what's being offered, you know, that, that, that may not be what it once was. But I'd still certainly recommend you be curious about that. There's also talking therapies available. And, and again, that's not saying you have to or, or you, know, you, you need to have therapy. But again, they're really good sources of information for signposting people you know, to, to um, other services that are available that, that myself and Sarah may not know about. Um, and there's also thinking about community centres, um, I'm very aware that there have been restrictions on what can be done um, for obvious reasons, but I'm also aware that, you know, when when lockdown was eased uh, a few months ago, a lot of services started to open up again and, and having a think about, you know, might you want to get engaged, you know, with those, particularly if you're feeling really isolated and, and lonely so that you can make those connections. And I think the, the key to a lot of this is, you know, nobody's ever afraid to you know, to, to sort of receive um, questions. Nobody's ever, you know, afraid to say, um, you know, can I have your help? You know, I think there can be a lot of fear around people saying I need help. But what's really important to remember is I think people, um, you know, from, from sort of many years of, of research and experience, you know, one of their biggest regrets has been not to ask for help. You know, nobody said the opposite. Nobody's ever come back and said, oh, yeah, I wish I didn't ask for help at that point. You know, it's quite the opposite. So, you know, I think you know, people can ask for help in lots of different ways, you know, whether it's, um, you know, company, whether it's um, support with day to day tasks. But, you know, 
if you don't ask, then um, you know there, there are real barriers in place there. So I think it's it's asking that question. Brilliant, lovely. And I've got one last um, question for you, Joe. One of our oh. listeners has asked: Are the slides available? Yes, I, I, yes. absolutely. Um, Sarah, have you, have you got a copy of them? If you haven't, I will. Yeah, I will get yeah them no, that's you. fine. We will have a we will have a copy of them. The recording will be up um, on the college YouTube um, website as well. No problem at all. OK, that's that's all of our questions, Joe. Thank you very much. Um, valuable and thought provoking presentation. And I know that I certainly will take something from it. Um, uh, thank you very much. Really appreciate oh. it. Thank you for your time. <laughs> oh, no, not at all. And, and th thank you ever so much for inviting me. It's been an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, and I really appreciate your and Dave's help in, in setting this up and all, all the other colleagues in the background. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Joe. Really appreciate it. Thanks very much. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.